Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Jason Deeren in support of Killshot this evening in conversation with Jeff Karub. First, a quick overview of webinars for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed, but you may want to keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Killshot from Literati. There's also a link to purchase books in the description below if you're watching us later on YouTube. If you're watching live, you can submit questions for the Q&A using the Q&A feature available to you at any time. And I will read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of the conversation. As a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming, whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where or when in the world you may be joining us from. Now I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Jason Deeren is a, an award-winning investigative journalist for the Associated Press and was a 2018-2019 Knight Science Journalism Fellow at MIT. His work appears regularly in hundreds of newspapers and websites, including the Washington Post, The Guardian, USA Today, and The New York Times. He has twice been nominated by the Associated Press for the Pulitzer Prize. And Jeff Karub is a senior public relations representative with Michigan News at the University of Michigan. He joined the university in March, last March, after nearly 30 years working as a reporter and editor, most recently with the Associated Press in Detroit. They can't um, hear you, but they can sense it through the power of the internet. So please join me in welcoming Jason Deeren and Jeff Karub into your living rooms. All right, thank you, John. Hello, Jason. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Thank it's you, John. Going great. Uh, it's going great. I am uh, talking to you from, from Dearborn, Michigan, and uh, it's uh, it would be great to be in person, but this is the next best thing, and I'm really glad that we can do this, and I'm really grateful you asked me to uh, talk to you about Killshot. Yeah, thanks I, uh, for doing it. You're welcome. It, um, I, should, I should note that I'm not here in um, the capacity of University of Michigan. You're not here in the capacity of the Associated Press, but really both do, I think, will play a role in our conversation. I think we'll, we'll sort of uh, bring up each of those entities um, in, in time because they, they do play roles in, in, the, in the story or at least the backstory sure. of this. Uh, so I... Uh, I wanted, I know that you spent three and a half years working on this book, which is amazing. Um, I, I have a little connection to the story. Uh, I wrote a couple stories for the Associated Press from Michigan, which some folks may already know and some will learn when they read the book, does play a significant role in the story that yeah. you wrote. Um, and you spent a lot of time uh, reporting from here. Uh, so it's, I remember I went out to Howell or, or near Howell, Michigan, and uh, I stood on the front lawn of a gentleman named George Carey. Mm -hmm. And uh, George's wife, Lillian, um, was infected with meningitis and she died. He held a press conference with his, with his family on the front lawn. And I thought he was prescient. Uh, looking back on this quote from 2012, uh, he said, our loss and that of others should be a wake-up call to our country. The apparent lack of suitable inspections should not have happened. That was very early days in the story. And I just, uh, I thought it would, I thought that's a message that, that resonates throughout the book. Um, people talking about all the failures um, throughout the process. I thought a good place to start, Jason, would be um, how did you come to this story and how did it become a book? Uh yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, as a investigative reporter, as a reporter who's interested in doing accountability journalism, one of the first questions I asked myself when I got interested in this topic, and for me, it came in 2017 after the federal criminal trials of, um, you know, the two main um, uh, compounding pharmacists um, who were involved in, and tried for, um, for second degree murder in federal court. I got interested after that and an editor of mine, I, we, I was casting about for 
new projects to work on. And she had mentioned the trials to me and said, hey, they're finished now. There's probably a lot of um, information like, uh, you know, court trial exhibits, things like that to start looking through. So that was my initial entree into this. So I started looking and the more I read and the more I learned about what happened in 2012 and 2013, I, I saw it as this great American tragedy um, with multiple systemic breakdowns um, along the way, like you were alluding to um, in terms of uh, inspections of compounding pharmacies. Um, but then the big question I had to ask myself was, well, why, and why do this now? Uh, you know, we'd gone through the outbreak. There was a law that was passed the year following the outbreak called the Drug Quality and Security Act. And so I thought, well, maybe they fixed the problem. Maybe this will never happen again. And so the deeper I got into it, not only did the story unfold in a, in a very dramatic way, and, and the more I learned about the science of it, the epidemiology and uh, you know, the microbiology involved in figuring out this disease and how to treat people, but, but then also the regulatory side of this, the accountability side of it, I saw that there were still uh, the gaps that allowed this to occur in 2012 still existed. And so I thought, well, I, it, you know, not only is this a great, um, you know, a uniquely American tragedy, but also there's still work that needs to be done in this area. And as a journalist, that's, you know, kind of why I exist is to shine light on problems that need more discussion and more thought um, so that maybe new policy or new enforcement actions can, can come from it. Right, it, it, um, and, and you do what, what we call in journalism a TikTok. Not, not the TikTok that's become you know, popular, big with the kids, but uh, you know, a TikTok meaning you're, you're, you're going, it's, it's basically uh, telling the story through time. And it, it does so in a very compelling way. And, and as you and I've talked about before, sometimes you go back, sometimes you go a little forward, but the story does drive forward from 2012 to the epilogue, which is 2020. Um, it's a it's a story that you know is is still being told, as you say. It's still it's still being told, at least from a criminal justice standpoint. And um, it remains to be seen just just whether we're going to get uh, serious about um, laws to regulate this kind of thing. Uh, let's talk about the Michigan connections that that I alluded to before. Um, I know you spent some time on the ground here, significant time traveling around. Mm -hmm. um, and Michigan was one of, if not the most affected states in terms of cases and deaths. It's right up there, if not at the top, as I recall. It's at the top, yeah. And um, you, you write in the book of St. Joe, and I quote, the hospital quickly became ground zero in the national emergency. There's, there's so many stories here, and, and you tell many of them. And I just wondered um, what stands out uh, of your time reporting from Michigan. Uh, what stands out the most is the, the way the community responded to this unfolding mystery, because that's what it was when it was unfolding. People were dying, people were getting sick. Uh, they didn't know initially for you know, a couple of weeks exactly what was happening. You know, there was people suspected that it was a contaminated drug, but there were multiple products used in all these patients. And so the epidemiologists had to, had to trace the supply chains for each of them. And as that's happening, folks are showing up in, in you know, at St. Joe's, which you mentioned there in Ann Arbor, the hospital, they're showing up in droves and the hospital's having to create a complete, completely new systems to deal with this. Um, and so that's one thing that really stood out to me was spending time there with all of the doctors surgeons, radiologists, you know, lab um, scientists, and hearing their stories. And, you know, and, and from my perspective, I'm, I'm taking all those stories and, and thinking, where can I put them together? So one of the main things I would say is there are so many stories, you know, you have to leave so many things on the cutting room floor when you're telling a story like this, or it'll get, it's just too much. Um, but there were so many stories of heroism and drama um, by the staff um, of that hospital it, that became under immense pressure um, and are operating without a playbook. Uh, there, is, there was no playbook for this. There was no uh, you know, kind of scientific literature for 
dozens of cases of uh, fungal meningitis with a rare fungus that had never been seen before in a human being's nervous system. Um, and not only that, there were surgeries that needed to be done and different treatment uh, um, uh, decisions that needed to be made on the fly with consultation with CDC, but uh, that was happening in real time. And so I, St. Joe's was, was the epicenter because there were so many patients there that I immediately thought I needed to go there and spend time there and because it's such a huge part of the story. And, and so I, what I did is I met with patients, of course, multiple patients who were treated there uh, or family members of those who died and the doctors. And then from there, I put it all together in, in kind of a chronological narrative and took out the stories that um, helped me piece together the drama, the sweeping drama of what happened in a way that uh, would instruct people just how difficult this situation was at the time. And it was incredibly complex for the, for the doctors and, and for the hospital. Among those people that you uh, wrote about or talked to um, were the Laperrieres. Am I saying the last name right, Laperriere? Right. Um, there was a passage in the book that uh, just, just struck me and it, in, in many ways, um, uh, just sort of as a microcosm of, of the frustrations and the anguish and the pain and the confusion. Uh, would you mind reading that, that, pa that passage on uh, page 113, um, talking mm -hmm. about uh, the sure. Laperriere's uh, story? Yeah, no, mind at all, thanks. Uh, yeah, so this is um, day 17. At, uh, it, it's a scene taking place at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in, in Ann Arbor. Um, and at this time, uh, you know, patients are just starting to show up to the hospital uh, and doctors still don't have a firm grasp on what's going on with them. So they're, they're reacting to, to what they're seeing. And, and this is where this uh, passage takes place. Three days had passed since Lynn and Penny LaPerriere's happy retirement was sharply curtailed. They were in Lynn's hospital room in one of St. Joe's dense brick towers when Penny saw the news crawl across the muted television in the corner. It went by quickly, but she noted the words, meningitis outbreak. Lynn's doctors were huddling just outside the room. He developed bleeding around his brainstem. Penny broke into the conversation and told them what she had just seen. Lynn gave her a skeptical look and the lead doctor also noted the information without reaction. She took out her phone and looked up meningitis outbreak. Headlines quickly came up about the CDC's investigation, the possible ties to NECC steroid injections and the Tennessee cases. She thrust the phone into a nurse's face. Look at this. But the medical team remained focused on Lynn's immediate deterioration and waved her off. She left the room and found a quiet nook off the hallway. She texted a tip line at Channel 4, which had run the news ticker, and was eventually connected to a reporter. My husband has all of these symptoms and nobody is listening to me, she said. Next, she dialed Michigan Pain Specialists, the clinic where Lynn had gotten his steroid shot, and was connected to Dr. Washabaugh. He knew about the recall. The clinic had received a voice message that morning from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services about it and the CDC's guidelines for contacting patients. He told Penny that Lynn was injected with a drug that might have been contaminated. Have his doctors there look for mold, Washaba advised her. Hmm. This is just not the kind of thing that anybody, anybody wants to go through. Um, the fact that, that there's, I think you write in the book about how it's not so much that there's a good treatment for fungal meningitis, there's just what's the least bad treatment. They, they all come with, with, with serious side effects uh, up to and including death. Right, and because you know, fungal meningitis is, uh, is, is pretty rare, um, in, especially in healthy people, it's extremely rare, but um, it's not such a common disease that there have been development of lots of drugs to treat it over the years. And so when doctors were faced with this you know, particularly mysterious type of fungal meningitis, they really only had a few options. Um, and all of them, like you said, um, come with very powerful side effects, hallucinations, kidney failure, um, and other types of terrible debilitating effects. And so, you know, a lot of the 
the patients who survived that had gone through uh, that treatment described real horrors. I mean, seeing, seeing very real hallucinations um, and just feeling terrible, but it was the thing that was saving their lives. Um, early on in the outbreak, before they discovered it was a fungus even, or had you know at least um, confirmed that, the mortality rate was 50%. People mm-hmm. were dying um, at, a, at a high clip. Um, once they started people on, on the fungal medications, that started declining precipitously. And then once they figured out what particular microbe it was, um, later in October, um, you know, a, a full month or so after it had started and dozens were already um, dying or um, seriously ill, uh, they, they finally could, targeted it. And once they were able to do that, then that's when you saw the, uh, the death um, curve go way down. Yeah, I mean, it's, it really, uh, people who have reviewed the book have said that it's, it's, a, it's a spine tingling mystery, it's, it's true crime, but, but the emphasis here really ought to be on true. That's, that's the thing. This, this really happened. Um, and uh, it was a race against time <clears throat> involving multiple medical detectives. I actually hadn't come across that phrase before, but uh, doctors, right. researchers, medical detectives, scientists at the local, state, and federal levels were working at this um, breast, breathtaking speed, or at least as fast as they possibly could. Right. And, you know, uh, when I first started reporting this, one of the one of the um, real draws to this story was were the public health epidemiologists who are detectives. That's what they do. They they investigate, you know, weird diseases in communities that are caught that don't have an easy solution or answer. Um, They're puzzles. And and that's what they're trained to do. And what this book will really delves into and, you know, this is, I immersed myself in this before, of course, our, our current pandemic. And so learned a lot about how the public health system works is that the state public health departments. So this started the first patient to be known uh, was in Tennessee, showed up in Nashville. And so it was a state epidemiologist in Nashville named Dr. Marion Kaner, who had training with CDC. She was a former epidemic intelligence service officer, which is kind of an elite detective corps that's trained of trainees. They go through like a two year program and they they learn all high level epidemiology. She had been through that program and immediately was concerned even though it was only one patient because then as soon as she looked into the clinic where this one patient had been treated, she realized a couple of other patients had also been had similar types of um, symptoms and had been reporting it. She reported that immediately up to CDC and asked for help. And then that's when you know you see the the states and the CDC start working together. And that relationship was key to solving this mystery and tracking the contamination all the way to this you know small time. Uh, custom drug maker called a compounding pharmacy in Massachusetts that was shipping its drugs all over the country. Um, and it was, it was those epidemiologists who figured that out. And so they were really, uh, f- you know, kind of unwinding their story. Um, and like I said, I came into this after the fact, I didn't live through it myself. So I, I had to go and interview everybody and put all of their, um, you know, actions, Thankfully, many of it is do- much of it is documented. You know, whether it be health records for patients or um, detailed investigative reports um, by the investigators themselves, and so I was able to kind of piece it together and see how it all unfolded. And it was really, it's really quite remarkable what they were able to do in, in the time they were able to do it, because this quickly unfolds into a national scale disaster in multiple states. And you know, it's, they didn't know how many people were going to die at the time. All they knew is that dozens. Were, were falling ill. And, you know, by the end of it, it would be some 800 infected people and more than 100 have died. And another thing is, you know, this, this story, while most of the people it, affected by it were hurt in 2012 and 2013, those who survived, like, as you said earlier, alluded to, this, this story continues on for them. And then if you look at the compounding industry and its effect on public health in general in the United States, if you expand it out from this one event, what I learned and another reason why I wanted to do the book is that it's not 
first of all, it's not well tracked. So there's not like some data database that I can go to and say how many people have been hurt by a compounding pharmacy. So you have to do it through anecdotal evidence. Well, there was plenty of anecdotal evidence that since this event, this had happened again on a much smaller scale through blindings, overdoses, and other drug errors made at compounding pharmacies that just aren't uh, being inspected regularly or aren't, uh, you know, don't, don't have the kind of oversight that you'd expect of a drug maker that's making sterile injectable drugs in the United States of America. And so I knew, uh, knew right there that there was, there was a bigger story here and an ongoing story that continues, you know, past the timeline of this book. Right. You, you spoke with a woman who actually warned, who, who saw the problems with the compounding pharmacy industry years before. Um, you, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to give too much away. I think people ought to read it, but you do spend a lot of time uh, in, in the clean rooms of the NECC. And mm -hmm. so uh, people do see what happens or what happened there um, and what didn't happen there, more importantly. Right. Uh, but, but, you know, I alluded to this being a mystery earlier, and, and there's still mysteries involved, too. Uh, uh, just because people have been brought to justice, it's still not entirely clear just how this happened. There's a, there, there are some good theories. There are some good ideas. But I don't think that, they've, that there's a slam dunk. Uh, they can pinpoint um, precisely what happened. But there were so many things that went wrong. It's almost a take your pick. That's right. It's, it's an example of when, when there's no inspection regimen of, uh, you know, whether it's a food maker or a drug maker, um, the types of things that can happen. And as, in, in terms of knowing exactly what happened, we were able to get, I was able to get pretty close because uh, while NECC was a slapdash operation that obviously sent, you know, some 17,000 vials of contaminated steroid lots out to 76 clinics in the United States. Um, they did do some environmental monitoring because it was required of them under you know, the USP. And so they had a staffer who would go around the clean room with little sponges and, and take samples from shelves and the floor and the work areas, and then put those sponges into a into a, a, you know, a dish and see if something would grow. Basically, she, that's how she figured out whether there was a contaminant. And from her records, I was able to find uh, numerous examples of mold contamination in that, in that facility throughout the year while they were making these drugs, including a mold hit on the very shelf where one of these batches was made. So there was mold on that shelf. Um, so while it doesn't completely solve the mystery about you know, how the mold gets into the vials themselves, it does show that there was mold very close by. And if somebody touched it, um, you know, it's on their gloves and they're, you know, then there you go. Um, right. But, but right. And, 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 and that's exactly why um, oversight is needed for, import, for, for, for dangerous drugs like this. I mean, if you're injecting something into your body, you know, that one of the surprising things of, uh, when I first started reporting this is I, I went to a bunch of doctors. Uh, first things, you know, and, and doctors that I interviewed for, for the book. And I said, when you give somebody uh, a, a drug, you know, a, an injection or something, do you know if it's a compounded drug or not, or if an FDA approved drug? Compounded drugs are not FDA approved most of the time. And they didn't. Uh, they just suspected, like most of us do, that if you're getting a drug at a doctor's office or in a hospital in the United States, that that drug is FDA approved. Um, and that's just not always the case. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the big takeaways from this is that compounding is, is clearly an important part of the pharmaceutical supply chain. Uh, it's, it's a needed um, thing, but when you allow it to occur like it did in this case and other, since, other times since then, uh, without sunlight, without oversight, um, you're going. You're going to have these types of problems occur, um, and so it's really important that people are aware that this these products are out there. They're in the, the system, and that you know if they're concerned about that, that they they ask about it. Right, and, and your your book talks about um, the the laws such as they are, the the regulation such as they are. Uh, it's it's pretty. There there aren't a lot of teeth to it, quite frankly. Um, as far as what's what's mandated, what's required to, to be reported. Um, 
I, I, I mentioned this to you before our, our talk today. Um, Michigan watchers will also note the appearance of uh, the late great John Dingle in your book. Um, and of course, I should I should preface this question with uh, a little a little uh, knowledge for people. This book, as I said, spans several years of time, and it did take quite a while for this to reach um, Capitol Hill. Um, I, I forget how many years, but maybe three, four years from when this started. Maybe not quite that far. Two, three years, maybe. No, it actually went straight to Capitol Hill and they passed a law the next year. Um, the trials, the federal trials didn't start for a few right. years after right. that. The trials yeah. are what carried on. Yeah. Well, so, so, so John Dingell, um, who's no longer with us, but um, was the longest serving U.S. congressman and, and well-known in Michigan, a real legend around, around these parts. Uh, and he was my first um, VIP interview, by the way, as a young reporter. <laughs> It's sort of a, a rite of passage among Detroit area one. journalists. You got to interview Big John, <laughs> Big John Dingle at some point. I mean, oh, unfortunately, yeah. you can't now. But anyway, uh, yeah. there was a there was a line that you shared in the book from from John Dingle, and and if you don't mind, I'll read it. It's pretty quick. Go for it. It appears, and I won't do a John Dingle impression, although I sometimes do. <laughs> I've had a beer or two. It appears that New England Compounding Center and other like-hearted rascals have engaged in the practice of figuring themselves a fine loophole to engage in practices that impose substantial dangers on the American people. And there's a little ellipsis in there. I did, I did shorten the line, but it was very loquacious, but, but, but very to the point. I would say that for a congressman, those are pretty strong words. Um, but uh, as you said, strong action didn't follow. Can you talk a bit about what does exist in terms of um, laws? Right. Um, so, you know, the question here is right now, compounding is, a, is overseen by the states. So some states do a much better job than others since this disaster, especially. Um, but the problem is, is that compounding pharmacies can still legally, especially now during COVID, because any of the kind of rules about this have been relaxed again because of the emergency for the need for drugs. And so they can ship from state to state. So while you may have a great, you know, in Michigan or in Tennessee, since this disaster, you know, tough, tougher laws and, and um, better oversight in Massachusetts where NECC was certainly has, has improved the, uh, the laws there as well. Um, the system's only as strong as the weakest link. Because if, you're, if you run a compounding pharmacy and you want to um, crank out drugs quickly so that you can increase profits, you can go set up shop in a state like, you know, I mean, Mississippi or Alabama or Florida, where the regulations aren't as strict. Um, and there are a lot of other states like that. And I don't mean to pick on, on those states, although they do have, um, you know, uh, there are fraud cases and others that have come out since then um, because their laws are a little bit weaker. But... So if you want um, some sort of oversight to ensure safety, um, uh, many of the people who are you know, way smarter than me about this, who I talked to for the book, who are in the book, who are drug safety advocates and have been for their entire career, say that some level of federal oversight is needed. And so right after this event in 2012, the Senate put forth a bipartisan bill that um, put FDA in charge. And FDA had been trying to gain purchase over the compounding industry for years, uh, and the industry had successfully fought them off at every turn. And uh, I go into great detail in that in the book. It's actually a very interesting um, example of, uh, of, of really good lobbying by the compounding pharmacy industry. They're really, really good at, at beating back um, attempts to regulate them. And it was no different, even in the face of 70 80 dead people, which is where we were then. People have since died, it's now over 100. One of the greatest disasters um, from pharmaceuticals in American history uh, and FDA still, even with that and the, and the hue and cry and anger over that, still couldn't get a, a, a bill through Congress um, that gave them the oversight powers like they have over big, uh, big pharma manufacturers where, you know, very exacting standards, like with vaccines, for example, those go undergo so much scrutiny. Every step of the process is measured and there are uh, redundant processes in place for safety. I mean, you know, those are some of the safest things you can put in your body. Compounding is the exact opposite. There are, there are 
there are none of these inspectors who can pop in from the FDA, do a surprise inspection and, and ensure that they're following the rules properly. And so that's, that's what the problem is. And so even, so the, the law that ends up passing in 2013 ends up being voluntary because the, uh, the lobby was very effective at arguing that patients would suffer if compounding came under FDA, that they wouldn't be able to produce as many drugs as they did, uh, as they do. Um, and so it, it's a voluntary standard. And you know, that's why we've continued to see adverse events, um, recalls, um, overdoses, infinite, you know, they make drugs for infants that are used in hospitals. Uh, there's an example in the book of, of overdoses from a, from a morphine that was 2,700% too potent um, that was used um, because of compounding error. And there are a lot more uh, of these types of examples. And so, so the laws are still what they were before this happened. I mean, essentially there were a few little um, advances, but, uh, but nothing that at, you know, that radically changed anything. Right. It's, and I know that there are people that you, you interviewed in the book, survivors um, or family members of those who had died, who are, who are just fit to be tied and, and don't understand why this of all things wouldn't have led to um, something more, something more substantial. Uh, I know, uh, I know we met in person a few years ago, Jason, it was a, uh, the Associated Press, my former employer, your current employer, who uh, gathered reporters in New York City for some, uh, for some data training to right. learn about data and, and how to work with it, how to incorporate it into our stories. And I thought of that as I was reading your book, and I wondered if it informed uh, your, your research and reporting, this, this data knowledge, of which I think you have more than I do. I, I, <laughs> that got pretty tough. It was like an advanced class for me. Um, <laughs> but also uh, just how your life as an investigative reporter prepared you for writing a book or didn't prepare you for writing a book. Uh, so th the short answer is I wish there were more data. Uh, and that's one of the really big gaps in oversight here is that even the basic um, information about how many compounding pharmacies there are and how many drugs they make, that kind of data would be really helpful. Um, there, you can kind of look at Medicare data. It's really hard to get um, and expensive. Um, there is some of that in terms of claims and things like that, but in terms of overall data of the industry and how much drug it's making for our supply chain, it doesn't exist. Um, but in terms of investigative reporting, the big treasure trope here uh, were documents. Um, the investigator, the federal investigators who put on the criminal cases uh, conducted a multi-year investigation that turned up through discovery tens of thousands of documents related. And that was a big reason why I was able to kind of reconstruct what happened inside NECC. I had a treasure trove of their emails dated, timestamped, from whom, to whom, you know. So I was able to see uh, what the reactions were at the time, what they were saying with each other, and then augment that with, with interviews of the people who were there at the time. Uh, so it, it was really that working with documents as an investigative reporter was key and crucial to this book. Everything in this book, um, save for a few stories that were built, you know, mostly on um, interviews, everything in this book was, is documented. Um, and comes in large part because of that big those big federal investigations. And once the trials were over, um, those documents became public and I was able to um, you know, spend a, a couple of years with them. Um, the other thing in terms of working with data that was really helpful is um, spreadsheets. Now this, uh, I'm, trying, I'm gonna, not gonna bore the audience here with talk of spreadsheets for more than like 30 seconds, but it, it's really actually very helpful to me. Spreadsheets, um, Creating a timeline and organizing that vast trove of information, including one thing, being comfortable working with them from data work that I've done over the years um, and building a complex timeline that uh, is, a, is also a visual aid to the story. So you can see in, in chronological order how things happen, where things intersect, overlap. Sometimes people's memories aren't right or documents are even wrong. They say something happened here, it happened there. So 
that um, that level of working with um, with spreadsheets and documents was absolutely fundamental to this to this process, and uh, um, it could, I couldn't have done it without it. I was imagining like a you see in the in the crime procedurals and dramas. I was imagining a cork board or a dry erase board <laughs> with the arrows and the strings and the bailing wire and the duct tape going from person to person. I, I, I want to do that one time. I do want to do that sometime. I feel like I, I want a whole room that I can just you know have a strings yeah. tied between things making connections. Right. But uh, in this case, I just did that exact thing, but digitally. And I instead of using strings, I used color coding. So if there was a, you know, a specific person's story, I put a color with that story so I could see again in the timeline where it popped back up. Right. I, I, think, it makes, I think it makes sense. And I think folks, even those who aren't journalists or reporters or book authors can appreciate um, that there is a good side to upside to spreadsheets. They actually do organize <laughs> things and thus our minds. I, I love them. I, I, I hate to say it. I mean... <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm probably, you know, like the most boring person in the world right now saying that, but I do, I love spreadsheets there. That's the headline. That's the takeaway from tonight. Jason Deering exactly. loves spreadsheets. Please exactly. buy the book. Yeah. I, I know we have some questions, uh, but I have one more question for you. Okay. Um, and it might just take us right to the time that uh, we'll hear from folks who are, who are watching. Uh, and, and you've alluded to a couple of these people already, but um, in stories like this, the villains are pretty easy to find. Um, and, and uh, you found a lot of heroes and we talked about some of them, the medical detectives, the doctors, people right here in Michigan, people in Tennessee. Uh, but I, I wondered if you could maybe uh, think about someone who stood out for you, particularly someone unexpected or uh, surprising as far as, as far as a hero of the story. Oh yeah, and like you said, there were so many, um, so many people did such great work, um, and and choosing whom to include in the book, and you know who I have to cut was, was really difficult. One of the most incredible stories that I uncovered while reporting this um, that didn't get reported actually at the time was a woman named Beverly Jones, who uh, is a fungal expert who works in the state lab in Virginia. And as the investigation is unfolding, people are dying, you know, hospitals are, are becoming overburdened with panicked people who had gotten these injections. One of the big questions going into mid-October, you know, a month into this thing, was what species of fungus was attacking the, the central nervous systems of these people? And in some cases, brains. Uh, sometimes it would go from all the way through their spine up into their, into their brain. And uh, that question was important for lots of reasons. Um, you know, fungi are different. Um, molds um, you know, act differently in the body. They have different um, kind of ways they, they operate um, or that they uh, interact with the immune system. And so th that knowledge was really key um, for targeting treatments. And Beverly Jones uh, working by herself in a lab um, was the first to recognize this fungus. And she, she had a really unique way of getting a sample from a patient to grow because they have to put them in a dish and actually grow the fungus so it gets big enough to be able to pull apart and put under a microscope so they can identify it. And, you know, labs around the country are, are, are you know, trying different, um, different foods to, to get the fungus to grow. And she was not having luck with those. So she just tried plain water. She had learned in a class um, in her training that sometimes water, as she said, makes the fung fungus angry. So she set to making the fungus angry and she used water and it worked. And not only that, when she got a, 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 the sample, a usable sample and put it under her microscope, she was able to identify it by eye. She had seen it, um, you know, the fungus that here uh, that infected all these people that was in the drugs there were a couple, but the, but the main one, Xero hylum rostratum, is an environmental fungus. People breathe, you know, you'll breathe it in all the time or you, know, you, you can come in contact with it, but it doesn't get into your body. You know, your, your uh, immune system, whether it's the cilia, your skin, you know, those, those early um, you know, uh, um, armor, that armor that you have 
you know, it doesn't let it into your body so it can do you harm. It needed that injection to get in there. Well, she had seen it in um, someone's sinus infection before she'd gotten a sample from sinus infection. She recognized mm -hmm. it and was able to send it to the CDC and get it um, DNA identified very quickly. And that was a huge break in, in this investigation and really helped um, you know, save a lot of lives because after that you see um, a lot more confidence in the types of targeted treatments um, with these antifungals, um, you know, ones that, this is a brown mold and so ones that you know, kind of would work better with that type of fungus. So it was, um, Stories like that were really cool. I love science. Uh, you know, this is a book. There's a lot of science in this book. Um, it's really about, you know, the public, the kind of unsung heroes of public health, um, state lab workers, the people who do this like kind of everyday science that is so crucial to our safety net in this country. And we saw it here during COVID, of course, and all the defunding of public health departments around the country and how that really hurt us. Um, and uh, this book is, um, is a testament to how important their work is. Yeah, and I'm glad you, you mentioned that COVID because it comes out now. And even though we're talking about apples to oranges in terms of uh, uh, medical health catastrophes, um, the lessons do, the lessons do um, cross over significantly and how we treat um, these kinds of things, these, these yeah. serious, serious things. Yeah. Absolutely. It's all connected. That system is here to help us through these types of disasters, you know? Right. So uh, we have uh, some questions. Do we not, John? We do. And uh, Jeff and Jason know that my internet has been frustrating tonight. So if I'm <laughs> reading a question and I start breaking up, Jeff, feel free to open up the webinar or the Q&A thing and and pick up where I left off if I can, Jason, you too. Sorry in advance. Michael writes, Jason, thank you for this incredible book. In the course of your reporting, you had the chance to visit several sterile compounding, compounding clean rooms and see how, quote, things get done properly. Can you speak to how much work and diligence that takes to be compliant with USP Chapter 797 from sampling, testing, to robust cleaning and disinfecting, all the things that any CC didn't do? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and there are a lot of people who do do this right. Um, unfortunately, you know, like I said before, the oversight system to ensure what he's talking about happens at each and every one of these facilities that makes injectable drugs is not happening right now. Um, but what he's saying is true. Um, so the USP that he referred to is the United States Pharmacopeia. It's been around in this country since 1820 um, when pharmacists back in the 19th century made a vast majority of our drugs in their in their uh, pharmacies. Uh, you know, there there wasn't the Pfizer and Johnson and Johnsons in 1820. The, you know, you went to your local druggist and uh, with an ailment, um, and uh, you got a prescription, and they most of the time made it there. Unfortunately, that system didn't keep patients very safe. It was again, it was a hodgepodge system. You were only as safe as your local druggist's capabilities, um, and the USP was there to try to standardize everything. And it's still the gold standard. Uh, and so pharmacies that, uh, that follow it to the letter, they have a system in place that is of checks and balances, of a sterility, uh, of cleanliness, monitoring, uh, uh, just a, a, a plethora of, of cleanliness standards that ensure that when the drugs come out of that pharmacy, um, that they're safe. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's one of the things NEC said it was doing. It, it lied to the hospitals and clinics that it was selling drugs to um, in literature and over and over again, saying that they followed these USP standards. Um, but unfortunately, like I said before, there was nobody in Massachusetts at that time going into the facility and making sure that what they were saying was true. They weren't matching the advertising with the reality. And unfortunately, in a lot of states, that's still a problem. Um, these state pharmacy boards don't have enough inspectors to go from place to place, so even if they're well-meaning. Um, and a lot of times, compounding pharmacies will, will be operating kind of, you know, in the shadows, kind of off the grid. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, even if they do go, even if they do know where they are, there's so many of them, they couldn't possibly do the type of detailed inspections that they need to do. Um, and so clearly something needs to be done there. Um, there needs to be some investment in either uh, in bolstering up states or getting, you know, 
the FDA involved in regular inspections. There's a, uh, there's a question from someone, uh, Jason, you can hear me, right? You can. Yep. Yeah. It looks like John froze up. That's okay. There's a, there's yep. a question from someone uh, identifying herself as the seed planter. Uh, this would be Pauline, um, <laughs> who you and I both know. Yes. First, congratulations. I'm beyond thrilled to see this dream come true for you and this book come to fruition. And now a question. What advice would you give to working journalists who also dream of publishing a nonfiction book? I know you worked on this primarily as part of a fellowship while not juggling a full-time day job. How would you advise others in terms of making it happen? And that's from Pauline, a former colleague of ours. So I think uh, one thing I wanted to say very quickly um, about Pauline, our former colleague, is that uh, when you asked me before kind of where the seed came from, and I, we were talking about uh, how I'd had an editor who said, look into those documents um, and, and see, I think there's something here um, uh, that may have been someone named Pauline. Uh, so um, thank you. Uh, in terms of this, you know, a lot of, I was very lucky to be at a point in my career where I could apply for a fellowship and leave my day job and go and do research um, for a year. And I'm also very lucky to have a, lucky to have a union uh, and a contract that allowed me to, that has a leave policy. So I took an unpaid leave from the AP for a year after I got my contract and was able to finish the book after the fellowship. Um, so I was able to take two years away and not lose my job. And that is such a privilege um, in large part because of the union contract that I have um, with the AP. So I, 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 first I wanna give that a shout out. A lot of people don't have that, um, especially these days. And it makes it really hard to get into um, a, a project like this and be able to complete it. And my advice would be, uh, don't, you ha first of all, you have to be committed. I have tried, I had tried numerous times before this to get book projects off the ground while working a full-time job and with, with varying success. This is my first book. I'd had a few and I, I turned them into other types of, of projects, um, you know, longer features or whatever. You just have to stick to it. Um, you can't give yourself a timeline. You have to give yourself a realistic timeline. And that means you're gonna have to work on weekends. You're gonna have to work at night after the kids go to bed. Um, you're gonna have to do those types of things if a book is what you wanna do with it, uh, with this, with the project. You know, There are many different ways to tell stories journalistically. It doesn't have to be a book. I really love nonfiction narrative books. I thought, this was just such a huge complicated story that it, it warranted a book. Um, if I would, I still would have done it anyway. If I didn't have that time off, it probably would have taken me five years, not three. And so uh, that, you know, my advice is just try not to get frustrated um, because, you know, it's, it's not a very lucrative endeavor writing a book most of the time for most of us. It's a, it's a labor of love. It's something that you, uh, it's a passion obsession, I would say, even at some point, I just, you have to become obsessed with it and you have to cut, but you have to cut yourself a break and realize that you also have to, to make a living. I, um, I took a nonfiction book writing class way back in grad school in 2001 and 2002. And the professor of that class, Samuel Friedman, recommended to all of the students th to not get a job at a newspaper if you wanted to write a book, to get a job as a bartender or something like that where you can make money um, and then focus all your brain energy on, on your book. So that's, an, that's not what I did. I, um, you know, I, I kind of took that class and then became a newspaper reporter for 20 years and then was lucky enough to be able to take a break um, after, in mid-career. But if you, know, if you don't wanna wait 20 years like I did, um, then you know, maybe, maybe it's about um, getting a, you know, a job that has a more flexible schedule or one at night. Um, like a bartender so that you can work during the day. But I mean, you do have to make some concessions um, for sure. Right, right. Great to hear from Pauline. Yeah. John, do we have time for one I think more? we have time. Yeah, we have time for one more. Um, and Carla writes in, uh, Jason, given your experience co in covering a very complicated public health story, 
Do you have any thoughts on how the media has covered the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, well, you know, the term the media, uh, I'm not really sure what that means. Um, we are a, a vast and diverse uh, landscape of, of media. Um, I, can, I can just speak about myself um, and the Associated Press, my organization, and I can tell you that um, I have been so impressed with many news organizations. When this happened last year, I was coming off finishing the book and coming back into, into daily reporting. And I know my news organization completely reorganized itself to be able to cover this pandemic. Um, from, we have a global footprint at the Associated Press. We have, you know, we have reporters all over the world. And it became the main story for many, many months, still is, but uh, that required a massive reorganization of resources from editors to reporters. Um, and I know a lot of other news organizations have, have done the same thing. So, you know, from, from that standpoint, uh, I think it's been that the media has done a great public service. Um, it, the media that I'm involved with, the Associated Press, and some of the others that I'm familiar with, you know, the New York Times and some of the other big newspapers have done a wonderful public service by um, exposing inaction and mistakes by the Trump administration during this um, and, and others who have, um, you know, uh, you know, risk lives through through policy that didn't factor in science, um, and I know that's what I wrote about. I wrote many stories this year about how uh, you know the federal government, the Trump administration specifically, was ignoring or suppressing science from CDC and other agencies, um, and you know that was my goal. So, uh, and I'm very proud of that. And I think um, my profession has done a wonderful job this past year in, in making sure that we're all informed um, about the actions of our government and how to keep safe. Thank you. I think maybe we just have time for, for one more uh, broad question before we, we sign off. Um, and a viewer writes, what were some of the, if you maybe you discussed some of these uh, when my internet wasn't cutting out, but what were <laughs> some of the challenges in telling this story? Um, I'll, I'll just say the main challenge was uh, it was geographically very spread out and, but all happening at the same time. Um, and there were multiple layers. So there's the, you know, the outbreak as it's unfolding and its effect on doctors and patients. Then there's the whole, like, why did this happen? Why do these compounding pharmacies exist without inspectors, um, regular inspections? How is that possible? That was a much longer story that was a, a political story that um, spanned multiple decades. And then you also had a, the true crime kind of criminal justice story of the federal investigation and the trial at the end of it. So weaving all of those various stories together in a way that makes sense, but also is compelling to read. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to write a book that nobody wants to read. I wanted it to be entertaining. Um, it's, it's a terrible, tragic story, but it also is a story like Jeff and I were speaking about of heroism. Um, of science, um, you know, and those types of themes, while there's a lot of darkness and, and injury and tragedy in the book, there's also a lot of light in terms of how science can, can help us through these dark times and how if we trust it and, 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 and follow its lead um, and listen to the experts and people who know what they're talking about, um, we, you know, we can, you can really greatly reduce harm and I think this story is a really good example of that. I think you know, it, was a, it was a terrible tragedy that hurt a lot of people, but it could have been a lot worse. Thank you. Um, I think that's a wonderful place to end. Jason and Jeff, thank you for such a lovely conversation. And, and thank you for joining us tonight on At Home with Literati. And thank you for putting up with my service provider <laughs> this evening. And I um, mm -hmm. hope to have you in the bookstore uh, when it's safe to do so. Um, but until then, we hope you continue to be safe and be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us as well. We hope you continue to stay safe and be well. You, of course, buy Killshot from Literati Bookstore at the links in the chat or below if you're watching later on, on YouTube. And, um, and we hope you, you stay safe and we'll see you at the next event. So take care, everybody, and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, John. Bye, all. Thanks. Bye-bye.